Hey folks, with us today, Michael, founder of Walls.io. Michael, super happy to have you on. Hi, Nicholas. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Awesome. The typical question is what the product solves for its users, but let's start even before that. You founded the company, but you spun it out out of the software agency and you spun out two products out of there. So give us the origin story. It's first of like, how, how long you, did you run the software agency? And then how did you come to the point where you spun off not one, but two products? Yes, uh, of course, happy to do that, Nicolas. Uh, so my background is, uh, I have, I've been working as a software developer. I wouldn't really necessarily call me an engineer. I was more like a, a hands-on uh, trial and error guy, but uh, I used to do uh, web development uh, when in, I think it was 2008 or 2009, I got super excited about uh, when Facebook first first published or, or, or announced their public API, because uh, suddenly uh, a small little tiny web developer in small little Vienna, Austria was able to to um, publish and run mini apps in the frame of Facebook.com, uh, potentially reaching thousands, m millions of people. Uh, actually, there were only a few 10,000 uh, users in Austria back then uh, on Facebook, which is also why... Uh, 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 focusing on social media was not a big business uh, back then, but I was very excited. And uh, one or two years later, with a with a close friend of mine, uh, founded a, a tiny boutique uh, software agency uh, called The Socialisten, which uh, at the time we thought thought is a very clever uh, word play on the the English word social and then socialisten. Of course, uh, we didn't have any political affiliations uh, though. Uh, later, of course, especially when we moved into uh, English-speaking markets, it got quite confusing. But back then, it worked. Um, what we did at Socialisten was we were the first, uh, the first, as far as I know, one of the first of the first uh, uh, German in the German-speaking markets to build custom bespoke uh, marketing apps on social media platforms like Facebook, even even MySpace back then, or Stubifold said had uh, small little APIs. Uh, and that was very exciting. Uh, and since we work pretty early to that, uh, to that whole new space, uh, we were also like modestly or quite successful in, in, in offering these services. Now, uh, building an agency, of course, was never really the, the, the end goal or the, what, what really got me excited. Uh, I wanted to build more scalable products, more scalable software. And uh, so it uh, so it was quite uh, uh, so, so it was just good to get started with the agency and out of the agency business and out of specific uh, experiences with customers. Uh, me and my team we developed two product ideas, which we later um, brought. Yeah, well, today you would call it MVP, uh, like a prototype, which which we prototyped for, for for pretty soon got first customers and then in the end spun out of the company, but that was like a, at least five year long process. So it uh, wasn't as easy as it might sound. Quick question today. on that specifically, how big was the agency at that point? Tiny, tiny. We were like four or five guys, uh, I would say, uh, all, all engineers, all developers, no, uh, no, uh, no marketing people, no sales, no nothing. Uh, it was really, really, really tiny. Yeah. But, uh, but still it was, uh, it was generating, uh, enough profit, uh, uh, to to kickstart and in the end bootstrap, not just this one business, but two businesses. Uh, the first one uh, being uh, SWOT.io, which is a social media management tool, think Hootsuite or think Buffer, but for larger teams at B2B at larger enterprises, uh, focusing on German speaking markets where I think we're doing pretty well. Uh, and the second product is Walls.io, Walls.io. It's also a social media marketing tool. Um, it's a user-generated content hub. I can talk about that uh, a little bit later. So these two product ideas came out of the agency business because we just talked to, to our agency customers and learned what they had, what needs they had, and then basically tried to abstract that into uh, uh, product ideas that would not just work for one or two customers, but hopefully 10, 20, hundreds of customers. And then right, like skipping to today, basically, how do you run those two companies in parallel so uh yeah skipping uh, skipping uh, to uh, to today is uh, also easier said than done uh so it's one one learning of course uh, in hindsight uh, you're always uh, smart uh, smarter um what i did back then is uh, i ran both back then i would back then i would say they were projects they weren't really like fully fledged products yet it wasn't really clear will this be a product or will this even be a company so 
I, I, uh, I ran both products inside the, the same company, inside the agency, the socialisten, which back at the day seemed like a good idea. But of course, years and years later, made it very, very hard to answer uh, basic, uh, basic uh, economic questions like how much profit does this product actually generate? Because all the cost and all the revenue was like so interwoven, it was not easy and clear to say like, okay, this product does that kind of rabbit, uh, profit and the other one. Then it was all mixed and mixed, mixed up. So it was, it was a mess basically. And only many, many years later, uh, I, I took, finally took the step to untangle this mess, the legal mess, the accounting mess and separate it into, uh, two, two separate companies. So it was not, uh, it was not as easy. So if I could turn back time, this was probably one of the things I would have done, uh, done differently. But again, uh, so many things in this, uh, in this, uh, journey have ha have happened organically and not so so much planned yeah. i have to admit so i'm not complaining but then besides the like the bureaucracy part of it would you also in hindsight do them sequentially instead of parallel like because like running a company or like yeah. having now a company but then even running projects takes a lot of mental space yeah absolutely and uh I mean, and, and something. Jo sometimes I'm joking. Uh, uh, there's this. Uh, there's this. Uh, this saying: once you're lucky, twice you're good. Uh, I'm not sure if you if you've heard this uh, this uh, this phrase. Uh, there's also a startup book about it. I have rephrased this for for myself, and I also have it in my Twitter bios bio. Uh, for me, it's more like once you're lucky, twice you're stupid. Because uh, <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes I felt like I'm the most stupid person to not uh, bootstrap, uh, go through the pain of bootstrapping one SaaS business, but two at the almost the same time. But what can I say? Uh, it was not really planned. It was, in the end, of course, a lot of luck uh, involved that we were in this hot space. Social media was new and that it was possible to bootstrap uh, two companies. Is it smart? Uh, uh, honestly, honestly, uh, only years later, I, I, I understood and, and made the decision The, the, the conscious decision to focus of one of my two, uh, uh, on one of my two babies. Um, of course, again, in hindsight, you're always smart. It would have been better to have done this earlier, probably, but it was just like, uh, my personal entrepreneurial journey was not like that clear cut thing. Uh, and, and, and that was just necessary to do that way. Of course, if you have a conscious uh, decision to make, do I really want to run two products? Uh, uh probably the answer is no focus on one. If you need to hire the right developers and ship fast, then React Squad is for you. A boutique agency that specializes in React and only works with fast growth startups. Get a 14-day risk-free trial and a transparent price of $95 per hour. Visit reactsquad.io to learn more. So before we jumped in and started recording, you told me that Swat.io now has a leadership team in place. So is there like a CTO, complete leadership team and you only talk to the 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 CTO uh, the CEO basically or how does that work so that you can fully focus on yeah. what I owe and then we will get there yeah uh, short answer is uh, yes uh, that's how it's set up uh, and like i said uh, my personal journey and some of the decisions took maybe longer as uh, as they should have taken like deciding is this a product or a company deciding to split the companies and then deciding to focus on one of two companies Those were hard decisions for me. Other people might have, um, ha might have uh, taken these decisions uh, uh, quicker. But when I decided, hey, I want to focus on one, uh, on one company, it was, I had the first, first decision, which of those two? Uh, for various reasons, I chose uh, the smaller one, the, the younger one, and the less mature one, that is Walsh.io. Obviously, because the bigger one, uh, Swat.io, is more established and more stable and in a different phase, actually, that is, Uh, me, for me, it's more exciting to, 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 uh, to work in the smaller organization. The How big business. is the, the bigger one roughly in terms of revenue or customers? Yeah. So, so Swatio, we, uh, so Swatio, we are talking about, um, uh, about we are on the journey from 5 million ARR to 10 million ARR. Let's put it like that. Uh, more on the, in the beginning of this journey from five to 10, uh, I'll be honest, but uh, somewhere in that space, we have a, a head a team of uh, 45 now. Here in Vienna, obviously, you can do the math on your envelope and we will see as a bootstrap business, there needs to be profitability. And uh, so that's like the ballpark ballpark numbers uh, uh, for Swatio. One, one last numbers question there. Uh, what was roughly the MRR when you left? Basically, when you decide, hey, I'm stepping out of the leadership's position and basically hiring a leadership position there? 
Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I don't have that number uh, in, 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 in my mind. Uh, but probably around a third less in terms of MRRs, or maybe maybe twenty five. So you like already so, hit the million ARR, and then yes, basically, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. yes, 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 yes. Uh, so, yeah. so definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Back to your question. Uh, so that was the first decision. Which of the two I want to focus on? I have very various personal reasons to focus on Walsall.io. and also to answer your question, of course, uh, finding a management team to run the other business, Walsall.io. Uh, it's a non-trivial question. Uh, I was super lucky uh, that uh, I had one uh, obvious immediate candidate, or for me it was like not a candidate, it was clear I want to hand over my company to uh, Johannes, who was my CTO for mm, more than 10 years or so. Uh, knew the company, knew the product, knew the market, uh, in some respects better than me, I would say. Uh, and uh, we, we complemented that was that was clear. Johannes uh, was uh, like a uh, uh, no brainer, and uh, it took took some convincing to uh, I had to convince him that he would, would actually like uh, get into this uh, get into this painful uh, role of being a CEO of a bootstrap company. But uh, after a few good uh, conversations, he was uh, he was uh, willing to do it. Uh, and of course, what what I did was uh, draw up like a mental, uh, not just not, not just a, a like a like a like a um, org chart and and check out which of the pieces I currently inhabit on this orchard need to be replaced either by adding skills to an existing team member or by hiring, uh, hiring someone new. And there were a few obvious gaps, like uh, someone taking care of the finances, uh, which to be honest, was never my strong suit, strongest suit. Uh, and also getting someone on board to complement the, the, the management team. Uh, who is taking care of uh, focusing on, on sales and, uh, and marketing. So we brought in a second CEO, Manuel, uh, who is taking care of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the growth part of the company. And Johannes, my ex-CTO, is doing product and engineering, and that's a good combination. And yeah, that means I have a great management team in place now. And uh, to finally answer the original question, yes, of course, for me, it meant uh, to basically that a big change in my personal role, uh, not being involved anymore. It took some discipline to not, to not chime in all the time and be that, <laughs> be that guy that uh, gives great advice from the sidelines. I mean, that's, that must be horrible. I'm, I think I'm doing mostly fine with that, uh, in that regard. And that means I have like a quarterly, uh, I have quarterly workshops with my management team, basically. And uh, I try to uh, I try to to keep it at that. That's basically my uh, the amount of involvement for me now. I am. I love it. And then let's switch gears and finally get to Waltz.io. So, where are you at with this company right now? So, how big is the team? What's the rough revenue? Basically, like where are you right now, and what are you targeting to achieve soon? Yeah, uh, definitely. So, uh, interestingly. Uh, in most aspects, and for a quite long time, uh, Balzio in, is basically, or, or Swadio is basically twice the, twice the size of Balzio. That's true of headcount. So at the Balzio, uh, at Balzio, we are at 21, I think, right now, 22, something like that. And uh, that's, that's also uh, true in terms of revenue. So uh, we are not at 5 million uh, uh, ARR at, uh, with Balzio yet. We are, uh, we are on the way. To, to reach that, but uh, it will take us a year or, or so uh, to be there. So that's quite interesting. So it's almost half uh, half the size uh, in, in many aspects. Yeah. And then before we because we skipped that in the beginning, what problem does Walt solve for its users? Yeah, uh, good question. Of course. So uh, we are basically making user generated content available for online marketers to reach their goals. What it means is uh, there's there's like a, 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 like plenty full of uh, of use cases. For example, event marketers like to collect all the social media buzz about their about their trade show, about their concert, conference, put it on displays, put it on their website. Uh, employers are uh, collecting what their uh, their team uh, their team members their workforce is posting on social media about their company. Put it on a career web page for employer branding. You can use. Uh, uh, user reviews from Instagram on your, on your e-commerce store. So there's a, a, a lot of different ways how you can use social media content for your marketing goals. And that's what Walsio as a social media aggregator facilitates and, and allows. 
And then how big is the typical client? So is it more like enterprise level big companies or or a wild mix? It is a pretty a pretty diverse mix. So uh I mean to 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 state the obvious, we are a B2B software company. Um although to be honest, if I'm really uh, if, uh, if I remember correctly or I do remember, there is the odd private use case as well. So so people who are setting up a social media display for their wedding, for example. So we have that interesting. It is it is <laughs> interesting when we first saw that we were like, ah, okay. Um, um, but of course, it's not a big business for us so, uh, or no business. So we don't really focus on, we are B2, focus on B2B, but it's really a quite diverse mix. It can be like a, a small mom and pop uh, event organiz- uh, event marketing agency that, uh, that, that uses our entry-level plans, or it can be really big brands. Uh, and we are super proud of that, of course. Uh, like we have a lot of big tech companies, US companies like Google, like Cisco, like Amazon, who are then using our product as well. So the range is super, super diverse. If I'm honest, uh, and also like what I said before, the use cases is pretty diverse. So uh, you could argue that this is also making, selling, marketing the product sometimes a little bit harder. So positioning is something that uh, that uh, is not fully uh, fully solved yet. We are still, we are always working on that. How can we package and position our product to to make the most and and, and uh, of, of these different uh, uh, markets and, and company companies that can buy our product. And then you have a team of like roughly twenty people. What's what's the split there on like product ops and sales and marketing? Pretty much fifty percent is going is uh, for for product and engineering. That's the that's the short answer. Um, we are so, so about half of the team. Ten, I think, uh, uh, maybe even a little bit more our engineers and product managers. Um, we have a sizable marketing team that's about four or five people um, because we are, um, yeah, today you call it product-led growth. Uh, I don't know, when we started with Wozio, I didn't, I think no one knew this term. It was not existing back then. What it basically meant, of course, is that we are very marketing-driven. We are bringing, uh, we are bringing people into our free trial through various marketing channels, paid advertising, inbound marketing, social media marketing, review sites, whatever we can find and try out. We bring these people in uh, and then hopefully convert them by letting them use, uh, 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 use the product. So that means marketing is very, very important to bring all these people in. We do have a small sales team as well, just like two sales engineers, uh, sales managers who are, uh, who are focusing on the bigger customers, like the big brands that I've uh, mentioned before. They need some handholding. We are doing like more enterprise deals uh, through our sales team there. And then are those two, two sales guys basically cherry picking the accounts that come in via the free trial? Or is there like, do they have like their own proper outbound channel where they like say, okay, let's, let's go after Facebook this quarter and let's chase them that's, down? That's a great question. And I think, uh, I think, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think you're talking to a lot of SaaS people, as SaaS founders, bootstrappers. And uh, I guess you, or maybe that's a question for you, or maybe you can confirm. I, I do also talk to a lot of people uh, similar to our companies and I hear growth is, is slowing down in 2023. That's like, for me, the big topic that I hear from so many people. Growth is plateauing, maybe sometimes even, uh, even, uh, even stagnation or, or, uh, or, or, or decrease in revenue. Luckily, we are not hit by that. So that's one, one aspect. Growth is slowing because of the macroeconomics, but also because uh, SaaS is so, uh, all the SaaS categories really are so saturated. There's so much, so much competition. What I, what, I, what, I, uh, what I really want to say, uh, only relying on inbound and marketing uh, is not enough for, for having a sales team. Uh, I think most SaaS founders uh, have learned that or will learn that uh, the hard way. Me, myself as well. Uh, in both companies, actually, uh, I had to learn this lesson the hard way by uh, ignoring it for too long and not investing earlier in uh, a real sales team that also is able to do uh, to generate their own leads to do outbound. So I was neglecting that for way too long. I think 2023, it's even more clear that this uh, in most SaaS categories will be uh, crucial. And, uh, yeah, so we are, so we learned it a little bit too late, but we are doing that now and let our, uh, our enterprise system also create their own leads by, uh, reaching out to, 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 uh, IC, to, uh, accounts that match our ideal customer profile by doing, uh, outreach and so on and so on. 
I think it's super smart that you get your hands dirty there and not only rely on the one, the people basically getting into your product. And what, one quick question, if, if you're open to share, like what's the, like not on numbers of customers, but just on like kind of like revenue split, like how much come from like the PLG versus like the enterprise? Um, that's, uh, that's a great question. It's not super easy to answer. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, about half of our revenue is actually coming through, through, uh, to enterprise. Sorry, I need to be a little bit more specific. That does not mean, unfortunately, that does not mean that half of the new revenue is coming in through outbound. I would love that. Uh, but we are not there yet. Uh, so out that the part of outbound is significantly smaller, but, uh, um, and, and maybe that's an interesting meta question. I mean, some people might say, the product-led approach and the sales approach are, of course, sometimes conflicting. Many people like us, we're trying to make it work, work uh, at the same time. That can, be, that can be a conflict, but actually, I think it can also work quite good because uh, uh, we, uh, our sales team can, of course, work on leads that are coming in through the PLG channel. And once they are identified and qualified and actually show a product engagement, we can then uh, sell to them. So... Long story short, yes, sales team brings in almost half of the new revenue, but not not everything is, is outbound, of course. Got it. So basically, like in terms of closing, yes, they close half the revenue, but in terms of lead gen, marketing or PLG brings yes. out the majority, and yes. then they yes. basically chase down the rest via the exactly, outbound. Exactly, exactly. But uh, honestly, because uh, that's the that's true, uh, and it's true because we probably were not we were probably too slow to to uh, understand that we have to invest uh, in in outbound. Um, it's never too late, hopefully, but, uh, 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 yeah, that's where we are at right now. But now that it's like more like a bit fresh in your mind, what are your biggest learnings about outbound? Basically, if, if illegally you would be forced to let go of your sales guys and scratch everything in outbound and would you have to rebuild it next week? Like, what would you do there? How, how would you get that started for the people who are currently only doing PLG and want to, to get there? Mm, that's uh that's a tough one because i never considered myself uh, so i'm not a salesperson uh, or, or i never learned sales i don't know who does learn sales i don't know maybe it's just a born ta a, a, a talent that you have or not i'm more the I'm, uh, i do have more a technical product background so i never considered myself uh, uh a good uh like uh, a worthy of doing big uh, um, uh, statements about sales what i can say is um I do believe that it's possible. So there's, there's this idea, this American idea that you have to, uh, separate, have to separate roles. Like you have uh, SDRs who are doing only outbound and you have account executives uh, closing deals. I actually do believe, uh, in, especially in smaller bootstrap companies like ours and in Europe, it's actually totally fine to, to have a full stack salespeople who can do both. Uh, as long as they're held accountable, uh, to generating their own leads and not just fed with inbound leads all day long. I think it's possible. Uh, of course, as, 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 long, as long as you feed them a constant stream of inbound leads, uh, there's nah, not so much motivation to generate your own uh, leads. But once that is, uh, that is settled, so, so I believe that it's good to have a combined role, especially in a small company. Of course, uh, as always, it's good to have uh, not just one guy or girl doing that, uh, that job, but two to have uh, the possibility to compare performance and see what works and, uh, and what, uh, what, what doesn't work. Um, what else? Uh, I think uh, if you want to do uh, email outbound, uh, especially in the United States, I think it's very, very, very hard to make that work if you are not really, really doing personalized outreach. Uh, um, I, I see so in um, our company, but also in other companies I'm involved with, uh, uh, like these dumb, dumb uh, uh, email outbound campaigns that have absolutely no uh, customization. Uh, personalization, except the name and the company name, and really sorry that doesn't count uh, as, as personalization for me. Yeah, uh, it gets like zero reply rates, uh, or at least no positive reply rates. So if you want to do outreach through email in the states, uh, I think you really have to drastically reduce uh, the size of your list and then uh, do research and and then do like proper customization. Personalization seems to work better in European markets uh, still the the dumb email campaigns uh, at least to 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 my experience interesting yeah the, I thought so too I mean uh, uh, yeah 
Uh, fourth, uh, if you, you it's it's okay. it's interesting uh, to start uh, doing uh, these outbound campaigns with uh, an out uh, 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 with uh, with an agency or an, an outside service. Uh, there is a lot of outbound agencies, also in, in in Germany. Some are good. To my experience, it's not always easy, but it's definitely a viable approach to get started with outbound using these resources before. You invest in your own team, especially if, like me, you're a founder with no sales background and no experience in outbound. It might be a good idea to work with a good agency for 12 months or so, learn the tricks, uh, see what tools they're using, and then try to replicate it with your with your own team. Maybe that's a that. So I I would definitely recommend to make sense. And then do do those agencies take like a flat fee or flat plus commission? How how does that collaboration usually work from your experience? I've seen different. I've th I've seen different models, uh, to be honest. Uh, but in the end, I think I think it works best if there is a, a a flat a flat fee, because otherwise, uh, and that's how we so, so uh, that's how we usually uh, work. We had we had also other experiences where we had like per leads example. Uh, but but of course, if you, if it's more like on on a lead basis, you will always have discussions. What counts as a lead? Is it like a qualified lead? And uh, who's report? Everybody's reporting different numbers. Uh, it's I don't know. It, it's not worth the hassle. I would I would probably aim for a for a for a flat fee. For example, if you are working with email uh, uh, guys or agencies, usually they have a flat fee based on the number of uh, email accounts you are connecting. And of course, the number of email accounts also means How many emails can you send without being uh, spammy, etc.? So, so there's usually like this uh, step function of uh, how, how, how expensive it is, depending on how, or depending on the volume that you're sending. Yeah, got it. And then, as the final question, because you mentioned Waltz is roughly half the size of of uh, the other product, how, what's your plan to chase that down? Basically, to to get the, uh, on par with that, what's your rough game plan? Just like very high level strategically yeah so uh, i see and and to be honest i think that's true for both of my companies and uh, and i think i think uh, for so many people uh, being bootstrapped in, in in our in our space and and and, and how, how big they are i think we we are on a clear trajectory to make these uh, 10 million ARR businesses um, that that must be the, the must be the next goal this must be the next step uh, we We must grow to stay uh, relevant. In, like in all categories, we have really tough com competition. So uh, not keeping growing and not growing fast enough is usually a step backwards. Uh, there will, if you're not growing, someone else will uh, will take them uh, take the market share. So it it is definitely important to 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 stay focused on the growth. It doesn't really matter if we reach 10 million ARR in two years, three years, or five years. But having that that uh, that that pathway. Also, of course, understanding what reaching that revenue will mean in terms of how, how will your team look like? Uh, 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 will my team be uh, four times as big? Will I have suddenly 20 salespeople? Will I need uh, a real head of sales uh, or uh, and stuff like that? So, so mapping out that, uh, that, that revenue path and thinking about how does the company look like at various uh, stages? So that's, uh, that's where, that's where we're, that's what I, that's how I, uh, try to look into the future of false I own. Awesome. Michel, thanks a ton for coming on today. Was was a fun chat. Yes. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it was good to be here. Uh, may I may I may I add a one thing a little plug at the end? Go on, go on. Happy to and, hear it. And uh, it, it just came to my mind because uh, because uh, I said like hey we, so many of us are on the way to from one to ten, from five to ten sorry a million. Uh, Uh, it just came to mind, and I not I don't get any money for this, and I'm not plugging myself. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to let everyone hear it because it's a perfect audience uh, invite or no uh, that uh, the European SaaS community is meeting in Dublin in October for the SaaS Talk conference. I'm not sure if you have heard about uh, that yeah. one. Uh, S a a s t o c k SaaS Talk. It's in Dublin, as I said. It's really uh, I've been there four or five times. I'm a huge fan of the conference. Love the people uh, doing it, and I I, I I promote the event anytime I, I talk about SaaS because uh, it's really a great experience to be there. So if anyone 
uh, is considering this or, or thinking about it, uh, take my word, it uh, will be a good decision. You will not regret going there. So for the guys and girls who want to grab a Guinness with Michael, you can do it in Dublin. <laughs> exactly, not just one Guinness. And uh, now that I'm speaking of, uh, I guess if you are really interested, uh, hit me up at michael at .io. I'm pretty sure I can get uh, a discount code for the listeners of this podcast because uh, after four or five years, I have a good connection to the people at Sastor. That's amazing. And we will make sure to link that up. And that's a wrap. Thanks a ton. Cool. Thanks a lot, Nikos. Thanks everyone for listening. If you like this episode, then you'll love the SaaS Operator, a weekly newsletter brought to you by Early Node, with actionable insights from SaaS experts in the industry delivered right to your inbox every Tuesday for free. Visit earlynode.com to subscribe.